So can you hear me well like that? Yes. Yeah, great. Because I don't want to touch the microphone. Okay. So, yeah. My name is Michael Morami, and I'm a security engineer at uh, Sertora. And this lesson is going to be about Vacus rules. Um, yeah. So here is a <coughs> here is a roadmap of what we're going to do in this lesson. So first, we're going to define vacuity. Then we're going to present two types of vacuity um, and Vacus rules. And then we're going to learn several uh, methods of how to deal with how to deal with uh, vacuity and how to discover. Uh, if our rules are indeed vacuous or not saying what we want them to say. Right, so if you're anything like me, uh, you might heard the word vacuous, but you don't know what it means. So let's start with a dictionary definition. Um, so Miriam Webster defined vacuous as empty, meaningless, lacking of significance, or lacking content, which could or should be present. Now, if we extend this definition to uh, vacuous rule or property, um, the definition would be empty or meaningless rules or properties that lack content which could or should be present. Now, uh, I want you to pay attention to the last one, which resonates uh, a lot with the way that we are actually defining vacuous rules um, in Sertora, and this is what we're going to see in this lesson. Properties that lack content that should be something we think we're saying, but we actually aren't saying. Yeah. Okay, so before we go to examples, uh, I want to remind you the, the logic definition of false statement. So false statement by logic is defined as the existence of a counterexample to a claim. Does anybody, everybody know that? Is this clear? You hear me well? Okay, sure. Right. So if this is clear, let's go to a real life example. Um, so I need to tell something about myself. My name is Michael. I'm 29 years old. I live in Israel and I don't have any children. Now I want to make a claim. All my children are Harvard graduates. So who thinks this, uh, this statement is true? Raise your hand. Okay, not Sartor people. None. Okay, who thinks this statement is wrong? You. Can you explain why maybe? Uh, because you don't have any children. So I don't have any children, so you say that uh, this statement is wrong. Um, but like we saw uh, before, what is the definition of, of a false statement by logic? This is, this is the existence of a counterexample. So can you, can you show me a child of mine that is not a Harvard graduate? If you cannot, <laughs> if you cannot show me uh, such child, then the statement must be true. And indeed, this statement is true, and hence it is vacuous, meaning that given that I have no children, then any statement about my children is irrelevant or it's just true. Um, this is happens before because um, we tend to think about um, we tend to think about uh, implication, uh, like yeah, like in English or in speaking language, we tend to think about it as causality, like one thing causes the other. But mathematical logic defines it a, uh, a little different, which means if I can't show you otherwise, then it must be true. Great, so here is another claim. None of my children are Harvard graduate who think this is true. Okay, you also? What about you guys? Okay, who thinks this is false? Okay, 50-50, great. So this is also true. Um, so given that I have no children, this statement is trivial and hence it is vacuous by our uh, definition. Is this clear? Okay. Great. So here is another um, real life example. 
Um, so as you may know, we are verifying Open Zeppelin's contracts um, on, a, on a continuous uh, project. And one of the project was verifying ERC-1155. And this is a real example of, of a vacuous rule that someone wrote. I don't want to name drop, but Jack wrote this, uh, wrote this horrible invariant. And uh, let's see what's wrong with it. So I'm going to look here because this is really small for me. But in uh, ERC 1155, we can see that we have a function of balance off. It takes account and ID, which is a token. And it requires that the account is not equal to address zero, right? Now the spec that one of our employees, Jack, wrote is that the balance of address zero for a, for a given token is equals to zero. Um, so let's see what happens here. Um, so when we, when we say something like that, we basically send in to the function the address zero, the account zero, and then the require says, okay, is the, is the account that you send me, is the address zero? Because it is, because we send it right here, uh, it reverts for every, uh, for every run of this invariant. Right. So th these are a few more rules that Jack wrote. Um, and you can see here that uh, in the other invariants, um, we required this first invariant, this invariant balance of zero address is not zero, is zero, sorry. Um, and do you know require invariants already? Have you heard of it, this feature? No. So a require invariant is, um, is the idea of requiring something that you already proved. So because we are dealing with formal methods or formal verification, we are um, often, we prove something like the invariant balance of zero address is zero then once we formally proved it, we can safely assume it on every other rule, right? Because we prove that it is true, then it is safe to assume. Um, so here we, pro we proved this invariant and we assumed it in the other rules and invariant. So let's see what is the result. We ran the, we ran the spec and we got that everything is verified. Now we already we can already uh, see that the balance of zero address is zero. This invariant is vacuously true, right? We send it the address zero. It reverted for this very case, so we basically didn't check anything. Um, okay. So now I have uh, a visualization of this uh, this kind of problem. We call it reach uh, reachability issue of a rule. Is the example clear so far? Great. So what we see here is a visualization. So the black circle is the space of possibilities. This is every possible value or set of values of the variables. The red circle is the desired state or the assert expression. This is what we want to see at the end, what we want to assert. Now the green circle is um, a constraint that we give to the to the prover right it can either be in the contract in form of requirement uh, requirement or in the rule in form of requirement um, right so often we use more than one constraint in a rule and when we do we are creating a starting state for a rule which is represented by the overlapping area of the circles right and as we keep and add in constraints, um, we are starting to get the, the start state smaller and smaller. And it may just happen that we added a constraint that does not overlap with the other constraint, which makes uh, the starting state non-existent, meaning there is no, there is no uh, set of values that satisfy all the constraints. Is this clear so far? 
great. So this is equivalent to uh, the, first, the first claim that I made about my children in Harvard. The starting state is non-existent. I have no children, right? So I made a constraint that is uh, uh, contradicting with something else that I wanted to assert, that uh, all my children are going to Harvard. Because the starting state is non-existent, then the assert has to be true, because there is no counterexample to this, um, to this assertion. Right, so with respect to, uh, so sorry. So with respect to the rule with a balance, we sent uh, the value zero to the rule balance of, and then we required that the account is not zero. Then given that we, uh, we have no start state, so we reverted for, for uh, the start state of the, uh, the rule, uh, the assert must be true, and hence it is vacuous. Okay, so questions so far about this reachability issue and the vacuity that we call reachability? No. Okay, so let's see how we can uh, catch this kind of, of issue, kind of bug in the code, uh, in our rules. Um, and we can do it very easily by uh, by adding a cert false in the end of the statement of the rule that we wrote. So uh, you, may, uh, you may notice that I have a rule here and we used an invariant. Um, the way that invariants are implemented is they are being um, transformed into rules behind the scenes. So I just unpacked the invariant into a rule uh, just to add an assert false at the end. Right, and what happens when we assert false at the end? We expect the rule to fail anyway, because when we get to assert false, it has to fail. Assert false always fail. Um, so this is the same rule exactly, and we expect it to fail. We expect a red X, and we know that if the rule fails to fail, meaning that it's passing, it's verified, then something is strange, because an assert false rule cannot fail. Cannot, sorry, cannot pass. So this is a run. This is a result of this rule with assert false at the end. And we can see that this, this rule, this unpacking of the invariant is passing for every possible method, which means we asserted false, it still passed. Meaning that uh, the start state is non-existent. We have a reachability problem. We didn't, we, we applied some uh, contradicting constraints. Great. So this is, this is the method that we suggest using, adding a cert, uh, cert false at the end. And because this is, th this kind of method can be quite cumbersome, uh, we provide you with a designated flag, which is called rule sanity which automates this process. You don't have to insert uh, assert false at the end or unpack invariants. You can just use this rule sanity in your run script and then it will give you this, um, this result page. And as you can see, the, the orange uh, icon with this lifeline is saying that the sanity is failed. And you can see this is true for all three rules that we've seen because we actually um, really required um, a vacuous invariant on, on the other rules. So questions so far? Great, everything is clear. Okay, so now here is another uh, check for reachability. Um, we call this method methods vacuity check. This is a, this rule, sorry. This is a, a very simple rule you can Right, and we suggest to write this rule at the beginning of, of your verification process. So this is the first rule that you should write and run against all your contracts. What is this rule? Let's go over it. So we can see that we define a method F, an environment E, and a call data args. These are just uh, technicalities that we need for the rule. We don't require anything in the beginning. We don't constrain anything. So. Um, our starting state is basically the whole 
set of the whole space of possibilities. Then we call a, an arbitrary function f, uh, and we assert false. And again, we expect this rule to fail every time. What happens if it doesn't fail? Then we know that we have a problem with the with the contract, right? Um, so there could be two problems. The first problem can be that um, maybe the contract is badly designed. Maybe the, uh, the the specific method that fails to fail or that is verified um, has some contradicting requirements. And if that happens, you can see it. Uh, you can go over it manually, and you can see that something is contra contradicting there, and you can. Uh, tell to to the contract uh, owner that something is uh, badly written, right? Another another case is that uh, maybe uh, the contract is um, is bound to an interface, and some function of the interface is always reverting because we don't want it to be implemented. So let's say we take an ERC twenty, and we don't want uh, this ERC20 to have a transfer from function, so we just do a revert f uh, require false. So no one can use the uh, transfer from function, even though it's on uh, the interface and we have to implement it. Now, the second thing that can go wrong is that we didn't set up our tool correctly. So I don't want to go into details about how we set up the tool and what can go wrong exactly. But just know that sometimes when uh, for loops are or loops are involved and dynamic types are involved, we need to change or tune the settings of the tool so it will run correctly, and it will know how to deal with this uh, with these complicated things with respect to formal methods. Right. Now, um, what we get from this rule is also a complexity check, meaning that we're gonna get um, we're going to get something like this, this result. We're going to see uh, what's failing, how much time it took the, the methods to run. And then if we get a method that runs for too long, then we know that probably once we start writing complex rules that calls uh, several methods or maybe uh, doing some requirements and asserts, uh, it's going to take very long time and maybe we need to uh, simplify it or summarize it in some way. So, um, okay, maybe maybe it's a good time to to say that in the repo that you cloned, there's a directory that's called um, vacuity lesson or something like that. And every example that I show here, you can run it later and see it uh, interactively run uh, and play with it. So, this is a run of the method vacuity check over the ERC20 fixed, which is just a regular ERC20 um, contract. And we can see that everything here is failing, just as we expected. This is the correct behavior of the rule. Now, here is a, another contract, ERC20 vacuity bug. And we can see that the transfer from and the transfer functions are, um, are passing which is not the expected or the, the correct behavior. Um, and this is due to uh, require false that I uh, injected into the, into the transfer function. But we can, uh, just, just from this simple rule, we can just understand that something is wrong with the function, with the implementation of transfer and transfer from. So, so far question, everything clear? Great. Okay, so the second type of uh, vacuity is tautology. So again, I didn't know what tautology means, so let me define it. Um, so tautology is the saying of the same thing twice in different words, a propositional statement that is always true, or a formula or assertion that is true in every possible interpretation. Basically, we're saying something that is trivial. So here is again, um, a visualization of, of this idea. So the black circle is the space of possibilities, but also the, the red circle is overlapping completely with the space of possibilities, meaning that uh, 
there is no set of values that uh, that does not satisfy the the space of possibilities or maybe I should say the space of possibilities and the assert expression is the same clear enough okay so if we start from uh, from a specific starting state from a constraint um, that means that no matter what step we do, what action we take, we cannot get out of the red uh, circle. There is not even one, uh, one option to get out of the, um, the red circle and get a counterexample. This is tautology. Great. So here is a, a silly and simple example. Uh, we wrote here two invariants, x plus y greater or equal than 5, x plus y is less than 5. These two invariants look like this in space, um, and they are valid. They are valid uh, or non-tautological uh, invariants, meaning that there are values that do not uh, count into in in the expression of the, in the assert of the invariant. So this is the white space here. Now here is another invariant, co a combination of the two first invariants, which is vacuous or tautology, um, x plus y greater or equal than 5, or x plus 5 less than 5. Um, this, is basically in, this is basically interpreted to the whole space of possibilities. Right, so this is the result of the run for these, these uh, invariants. And, um, the first two are failing for a specific counterexample. Uh, it's not really matter what, why, but what I want to look at is the vacuous invariant, which passes. Right. So what we can do? Uh, okay. So sorry. It it passes, and I think it's quite clear that it's a tautology, like we like we talked. So what we can do to find this uh, tautology? What we do. Uh, in order to find out if uh, if an invariant expression is indeed uh, trivial, is we export the expression of the invariant into a rule that just assert the expression. So what's going on here? We are starting from any possible state, from the space of possibilities. Um, this is this is our starting state, and then we just assert the expression. Um, I don't have the picture here, so I'm just going to go up real quick. So if we look at this picture, you can imagine that the green circle is actually the same as the black circle and the red circle. We're starting from a position where the starting state is the space of possibilities, and uh, we want to see if there exists even one case where uh, this expression can be false, one counterexample. If we can't find one, yeah, if we can't find one, it, this is this rule, it is verified, it fails to fail, and then we know that this is a trivial claim. Um, okay, any questions about tautology? Good students. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go over the last thing, which is something we call half, half vacuity, half vacuous rules. Um, this is something, uh, I don't see the other part, uh, I'm missing, uh, the rule here. I think this is the old, the old presentation. Yeah, I'm missing the rest. Can we open? This one? Mm -mm. I want to see my Sorry. We'll get the, the new presentation on in a second. Read only. Ah, uh, this is the read only one. Hmm. Wait, let's get to the other one. Where is that? From Slack? Da, da, da. 
dati. Two pins are so cool here. Mm -hmm. Just like in practice. Yeah. <laughs> I think you were. Um, where were we? Um, right here. Yeah. Here. yeah. Okay. Um, so we were here. Wait, so. Wait, wait, wait. It's not showing. Yes. Oh, why not? I think we need ah, to. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so about half acuities. So um, half acuities is what we call uh, a rule that doesn't cover as much as we would like it to cover. Right, so um, here's an example of wrapped it. Um, and wrapped it, uh, I don't know if you know, um, basically you send, you send it to the, to the contract and it's mint in wrapped it. Uh, so, so it will be an ERC uh, compliable token. So you can see the map here that is balance of, it keeps the balance of all the users. Uh, there is a function that is deposit, it's payable, you're sending ETH to it, and then it's minting uh, the value of ETH, um, the, the respective amount. Now here is a rule that we wrote, um, which is uh, unit test for deposit. In here, um, we define uh, an environment, then we check the balance before of the message sender, we deposit, and we check the balance after. Um, uh, at the end, we assert that the balance, uh, the balance after is equal to the balance before plus the message value. Makes sense, right? This is simple unit test. So if we run it, we get a big check mark. It's verified. But I'd argue that this, uh, this rule doesn't check as much as we'd like it to check. And why I'm saying that? You may know that payable, uh, sorry, non-payable function has an implicit uh, requirement that the message value is exactly zero. And uh, when we call, um, if you remember the first lesson by Armin, um, we explained that the environment is in the Sartori verification language encapsulates every data about the message, transaction, and block data. Um, so when we send um, the same environment to a payable and non-payable function, we basically um, constrained the message value to be exactly zero because of the implicit requirement in non-payable function. And then we send this same value to the payable function. So we can show that um, the rule checked only the case of message value equals to zero by showing this, by adding this requirement to the deposit. So here I require that message value is not equal to zero. This uh, reduces the space of possibilities by exactly one possibility, right? Only message value equal to zero. But when I run rule sanity on this new rule, with, with a new requirement, I see that indeed I have a reachability problem for my unit test. So what we suggest to do, how we can find these kind of bugs. So what we suggest is uh, inject bugs into the code, meaning that we generate uh, a version of, or several versions of the contract with intentional bugs in them. We run the same rules on, on the buggy versions. We expect the relevant rules to fail. And then we, uh, we see if the rule fails. If the rule fails, then it finds this bug and we can say, okay, at least the, the coverage is not that bad. We don't know if it's very good, but it's not, it's not so bad. Um, but if it fails to fail, so if it's verified, 
then uh, we know that the coverage is not as good as we as we want it to be. So here is a, a bug that I injected. I made the the deposit function burn um, burn tokens instead of mint in them, and this is the result of the same unit test. It passes. Right? It doesn't make sense. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll go over it again. I changed the, the minting into burning, and the rule uh, says check that the balance after is equal to the balance before plus the, the value. But there is, there is a, a deviation from what the contract actually do, and I know that it's actually burning. So in reality, the balance after should be always uh, less than than the balance before. Is this clear? Okay. So because because there's a deviation, we know that the message value, um, <coughs> because I told you the message value is only zero in this case, um, <coughs> and uh, we know that it's verified because of that, because it doesn't matter if you add or subtract uh, zero from the balance, it would still be equal. We know that the rule doesn't cover as much as we expect it to cover, right? Um, and that's it. And now we know that the rule that we wrote is is not good. It's not it's not uh, a well written rule, and we need to fix it. So now here is a fix. And um, I'll be honest. I, I fixed this rule, and the the result kind of surprised me. But we'll see why. So the, the fix is um, we create another env, another environment that encapsulates all the message data, and we require that the message sender of the first E is equal to the message sender of the second E. Then we call the deposit function and the balance of function with different environments. So the message sender here of E2 is the same message sender as deposit, but the message value is not necessarily the same. Now, I expected this rule to pass, um, but in reality, it failed. And it took me a while to understand, and Armin helped me on that, <laughs> uh, on that one. Um, uh, the reason that it failed is because wrapped it is written in Solidity 418, and for some reason, I was sure that uh, it was on a much much more advanced uh, solidity that implements the the safe safe math um, library, and we get here uh, an overflow. So if I go back to the rule, even when the rule is well written, there is a situation when um, we start with a certain amount of balance, we transfer balance to we transfer ETH to the deposit function and we get less balance at the end. This is an overflow. Great. Yeah, this is the real version. Uh, I think uh, I was thinking about it. I think the reason that uh, they don't care about it is because the ETH is anyway, yeah, it's bound by UIN 256, so you cannot actually send ETH more than yeah, overflow. Okay, so okay, this is this is the end of the of the lesson. So the main takeaway is check your spec. Like whatever we whatever I taught you here are methods to um, to check that you write in rules that are not vacuous. It's not necessarily mean that these are very good rules or these, these properties are uh, very smart, but this is another way to, to verify or to make sure that you don't think that you're saying something, but you're actually saying something that is lack of, con of content. So how you can uh, check your spec? Um, start always by doing running the method vacuity check. You need to make sure that everything fails, check that no, uh, no methods in the contract are uh, vacuously uh, like reverting, always reverting, set up the tool correctly, 
check that uh, the running times are are low enough. Um, the second thing that you can do is after every time you verify a rule or at the end of, of your verification process, when you have rules that you verify, then you're quite confident in them, run the minus minus rule sanity flag. Run, run it on the whole spec and make sure that uh, everything passes and there are no reachability issues and there are no tautology issues. So I kind of skipped it, but um, we have two kind of rule sanity. Uh, the flag rule sanity can run in two versions. It can run just rule sanity, which is a basic, uh, a, a basic version that checks the reachability issues. And if you add the advanced uh, keyword here, then it's going to check for other for additional things. So the tautology of invariants and also uh, for redundant requirements, which is uh, another another thing that is is nice to have because when you require we, where you over require things even if it's not uh, uh, vacuous uh, you just reduce your coverage in the of the property um, yeah and the last thing is inject bugs to your codes preferably many of them and preferably someone else do it because sometimes uh, when you do it for yourself you just uh, you have a certain certain thing in mind uh, that you want to check and you don't check all possibilities so when a fresh when a fresh person do it uh, it's usually better um, yeah and the last thing is that this bug injection thing is also time consuming and we are working on automation uh, of this process we call it mutation testing it's basically should be a flag just like the minus minus rule sanity um, which will basically uh, inject bugs automatically like change plus to minuses uh, greater to to smaller and stuff like that uh, uh, and then you can see if if the bugs are uh, make sense or doesn't make sense and check for your rules so this is it for 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 the lesson um, so for the exercise now uh, you already wrote uh, rules for for the symbolic pool right uh, so now we suggest that you check uh, you check for vacuity of of your rules by using the rule sanity and bug injection um, and also you can play with the with the examples that I showed here they're also available on the repo Thank you.